How the Whale Got His Throat In the sea, once upon a time, O oh my best beloved, there was a whale, and he ate fishes. He ate the starfish and the garfish, and the crab and the dab, and the place and the dace, and the skate and his mate, and the mackerel and the pickerel, and the really truly twirly-whirly eel. All the fishes he could find in all the sea he ate with his mouth, so. Till at last there was only one small fish left in all the sea, and he was a small stoot fish, and he swam a little way behind the whale's right ear, so as to be out of harm's way. Then the whale stood up on his tail and said, I'm hungry. And the small stoot fish said in a small stoot voice, Noble and generous cetacean, have you ever tasted man? No, said the whale. What is it like? Nice, said the small stoot fish. Nice, but nubbly. Then fetch me some, said the whale, and he made the sea froth up with his tail. One at a time is enough, said the stoot fish. If you swim to latitude fifty north, longitude forty west, that is magic, you will find, sitting on a raft, in the middle of the sea, with nothing on but a pair of blue canvas breeches, a pair of suspenders, you must not forget the suspenders, best beloved, and a jackknife, one shipwrecked mariner who, it is only fair to tell you, is a man of infinite resource and sagacity. So the whale swam and swam to latitude fifty north, longitude forty west, as fast as he could swim, and on a raft, in the middle of the sea, with nothing to wear except a pair of blue canvas breeches, a pair of suspenders, you must particularly remember the suspenders, best beloved, and a jackknife, he found one single solitary shipwrecked mariner trailing his toes in the water. He had his mummy's leave to paddle, or else he would never have done it, because he was a man of infinite resource and sagacity. Then the whale opened his mouth back and back and back, till it nearly touched his tail, and he swallowed the shipwrecked mariner, and the raft he was sitting on, and his blue canvas breeches, and the suspenders, which you must not forget, and the jackknife. He swallowed them all down into his warm, dark inside cupboards, and then he smacked his lips, so, and turned round three times on his tail. But as soon as the mariner— who was a man of infinite resource and sagacity, found himself truly inside the whale's warm, dark inside cupboards, he stumped and he jumped, and he thumped and he bumped, and he pranced and he danced, and he banged and he clanged, and he hit and he bit, and he leaped and he creeped, and he prowled and he howled, and he hopped and he dropped, and he cried and he sighed, and he crawled and he bawled, and he stepped and he leapt, and he danced hornpipes where he shouldn't, and the whale felt most unhappy indeed." Have you forgotten the suspenders? So he said to the stoot fish, This man is very nubbly, and besides he is making me hiccup. What shall I do? Tell him to come out, said the stoot fish. So the whale called down his own throat to the shipwrecked mariner. Come out and behave yourself. I've got the hiccups. Nay, nay, said the mariner, not so, but far otherwise. Take me to my natal shore, and the white cliffs of Albion, and I'll think about it. And he began to dance more than ever. You had better take him home, said the stoot fish to the whale. I ought to have warned you that he is a man of infinite resource and sagacity. So the whale swam and swam and swam, with both flippers and his tail, as hard as he could for the hiccups, and at last he saw the mariner's natal shore, and the white cliffs of Albion, and he rushed halfway up the beach, and opened his mouth wide and wide and wide, and said, "'Change here for Winchester, Ashwalot, Nashua, Keene, and stations on the Fitchburg Road.' And just as he said Fitch, the mariner walked out of his mouth. But while the whale had been swimming, the mariner, who was indeed a person of infinite resource and sagacity, had taken his jackknife and cut up the raft into a little square grating all running criss-cross, and he had tied it firm with his suspenders. 
"'Now you know why you were not to forget the suspenders.' "'And he dragged that grating good and tight into the whale's throat, and there it stuck. "'Then he recited the following sloka, which, as you have not heard it, "'I will now proceed to relate. "'By means of a grating I have stopped your ating. "'For the mariner was also an Hibernian. "'And he stepped out on the shingle and went home to his mother,' who had given him leave to trail his toes in the water, and he married and lived happily ever afterward. So did the whale. But from that day on, the grating in his throat, which he could neither cough up nor swallow down, prevented him eating anything except very, very small fish, and that is the reason why whales nowadays never eat men or boys or little girls. The small stute fish went and hid himself in the mud under the door sills of the equator. He was afraid that the whale might be angry with him. The sailor took the jackknife home. He was wearing the blue canvas breeches when he walked out on the shingle. The suspenders were left behind, you see, to tie the grating with. And that is the end of that tale. When the cabin portholes are dark and green because of the seas outside, when the ship goes whop with a wiggle between, and the steward falls into the soup tureen, and the trunks begin to slide. When Nursie lies on the floor in a heap, and Mummy tells you to let her sleep, and you aren't waked, or washed, or dressed, why, then you will know if you haven't guessed. You're fifty north and forty west. How the Camel Got His Hump In the beginning of years, when the world was so new and all, and the animals were just beginning to work for man. There was a camel, and he lived in the middle of a howling desert because he did not want to work, and besides, he was a howler himself. So he ate sticks and thorns and tamarisks and milkweed and prickles, most scruciating idle, and when anybody spoke to him he said, Humph! Just humph! And no more. Presently the horse came to him on Monday morning with a saddle on his back and a bit in his mouth, and said, "'Camel, O oh camel, come out and trot like the rest of us.' Humph said the camel, and the horse went away and told the man. Presently the dog came to him with a stick in his mouth, and said, "'Camel, O oh camel, come and fetch and carry like the rest of us.' Humph said the camel, and the dog went away and told the man." Presently the ox came to him with the yoke on his neck, and said, "'Camel, O oh camel, come and plough like the rest of us.' "'Humph!' said the camel, and the ox went away and told the man. At the end of the day the man called the horse and the dog and the ox together, and said, "'Three, O oh three, I'm very sorry for you, with the world so new and all, but that humph thing in the desert can't work, or he would have been here by now.' So I am going to leave him alone, and you must work double time to make up for it. That made the three very angry, with the world so new and all, and they held a palaver, and an indaba, and a punchayat, and a powwow on the edge of the desert, and the camel came chewing on milkweed most scruciating idle, and laughed at them. Then he said, Humph! and went away again. Presently there came along the djinn in charge of all deserts, rolling in a cloud of dust. Djinns always travel that way because it is magic, and he stopped to palaver and powwow with the three. Djinn of all deserts, said the horse, is it right for anyone to be idle, with the world so new and all? Certainly not, said the djinn. Well, said the horse, there's a thing in the middle of your howling desert— and he's a howler himself, with a long neck and long legs, and he hasn't done a stroke of work since Monday morning. He won't trot. Whew, said the djinn, whistling. That's my camel, for all the gold in Arabia. What does he say about it? He says, humph, said the dog, and he won't fetch and carry. Does he say anything else? Only humph, and he won't plow, said the ox. "'Very good,' said the djinn. "'I'll humph him if you will kindly wait a minute.' 
the djinn rolled himself up in his dust cloak and took a bearing across the desert and found the camel most scruciatingly idle looking at his own reflection in a pool of water my long and bubbling friend said the djinn what's this i hear of your doing no work with the world so new and all humph said the camel the djinn sat down with his chin in his hand and began to think a great magic while the camel looked at his own reflection in the pool of water you've given the three extra work ever since monday morning all on account of your scruciating idleness said the djinn and he went on thinking magics with his chin in his hand humph said the camel i shouldn't say that again if i were you said the djinn you might say it once too often bubbles i want you to work and the camel said humph again but no sooner had he said it than he saw his back that he was so proud of puffing up and puffing up into a great big lolloping humph do you see that said the djinn that's your very own humph that you've brought upon your very own self by not working today is thursday and you've done no work since monday when the work began now you are going to work how can i said the camel with this humph on my back that's made a purpose said the djinn all because you missed those three days you will be able to work now for three days without eating because you can live on your humph and don't you ever say i never did anything for you come out of the desert and go to the three and behave humph yourself and the camel humphed himself humph and all and went away to join the three and from that day to this the camel always wears a humph we call it a hump now not to hurt his feelings but he has never yet caught up with the three days that he missed at the beginning of the world and he has never yet learned how to behave the camel's hump is an ugly lump which well you may see at the zoo but uglier yet is the hump we get from having too little to do kiddies and grown-ups too if we haven't enough to do we get the hump camellius hump the hump that is black and blue we climb out of bed with a frowsily head and a snarly yarly voice we shiver and scowl and we grunt and we growl at our bath and our boots and our toys and there ought to be a corner for me and i know there is one for you when we get the hump camellius hump the hump that is black and blue the cure for this ill is not to sit still or froust with a book by the fire but to take a large hoe and a shovel also and dig till you gently perspire and then you will find that the sun and the wind and the gin of the garden too have lifted the hump the horrible hump the hump that is black and blue i get it as well as you if i haven't enough to do we all get hump camellius hump kiddies and grown-ups too <laughs>